I'm going to talk uh, this time about Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. Anapana means in and out breath, and uh, sati is mindfulness. This is a very f fundamental meditation practice in uh, many Buddhist traditions. It's a foundation, and there are different ways of doing it. One can be mindful of the breath at the nose or at the uh, chest or the abdomen. Or one can follow the breath in the entire body. The method I wish to speak about uh, is uh, putting awareness on the sensation of the breath at the nose, which is probably the most traditional method in Theravada tradition, at least. In the uh, Satipatthana Sutta, the, uh, the phrase is to play for Anapanasati is to place the awareness adimukha, which means literally in front of the face. And this has been interpreted in different ways, but generally it, it's taken to mean the sensation of breath at the nose tip. And this is certainly the method that's spoken of by Buddha Gosa in the Vasudhimaga. So it has a, a long uh, lineage as a, as a specific method. This is uh, primarily a samatha meditation, which means it's a meditation that is uh, focused on developing the quality of samadhi, and it leads eventually to the mind entering jhana. Uh, so we need to talk about these these terms a, a little bit. Uh, one of the um, issues or problems I've seen over the years with people practicing this meditation is that they push too hard. And I think a lot of the the problem comes from the English translations that have become standard that I believe are misleading in many ways and, and actually detrimental to the, to the meditator. And at the top of the list, I would put the standard translation of samadhi, which is everywhere translated as concentration. And this really, so you'll see in books in English, concentration, meditation, developing concentration, etc., when they're talking about samadhi. And I think this is really dead wrong. When you see the uh, definition of samadhi as given in the old texts like the Abhidhamma and the Vasudhimagga, the definition is a stillness or stability uh, one phrase that's used is non-wavering. So it's a stillness of mind. It's not a concentrated mind. And I think this is the um, misleading phraseology causes meditators to narrow their mind onto the breath. Uh, whereas the mind with samadhi... should be an open, expansive mind. Remember that the state of jhana, which is the perfection of samadhi, the state of jhana is the equivalent of the mind state of a Brahma god. And a Brahma god can contemplate thousands of world systems at once. So he, his mind is vast and open and expansive. and this is the kind of mind we're developing with samadhi, not a narrow, tight, constrained mind. But it is stable, it's still, meaning that there is only one object. It's not flitting from object to object. And this is the key of, uh, or really the definition of developing samadhi, is that the mind is stabilized and still solid filled with a single object. So with Anapanasati, 
we're filling the mind with the sensation of breathing. And what we're paying attention to is the physical sense of touch at the uh, nostrils, which are compared to a gate. You know, uh, there's one um, simile for the mind watching the breath is a watchman in a, a room over the town gate and he's watching people coming in and out of the town. He doesn't follow them into the town or he doesn't follow them out of the town, he, but he pays attention to who's going in and who's going out. And this is uh, where how we hold our mind in uh, Anapanasati is the sensitive uh, tissue in, in the nostril, feeling the air passing in and out of the body. And in this method, you don't follow the breath into the body. You don't follow the breath out of the body. You're just staying still at that one point and watching the breath pass. Another analogy that's used is um, sawing a piece of wood with a handsaw. The carpenter pays attention to the point where the saw is cutting in and out of the wood. He doesn't follow with his eyes or his mind the saw going up and down. So that's, uh, that's the, the first important point to bear in mind is uh, the meaning of samadhi is stillness and stabilized on, on a single object. So the proper way of holding the mind then is not to push the mind onto the object, but to hold the mind in a state of receptiveness and uh, expansive open awareness, but to only pay attention to the physical sensation of breathing. So part of the skill of developing Anapanasati or any Samatha meditation is learning the skill of non-attention. That is, anything else that arises to the mind, whether it's a, um, a thought or a memory or external object like a sound or a sensation in the body, you disregard it. You, do, you pay no attention to it. You don't try and suppress it. You know, so that's a kind of negative attention. You just disregard it and allow it to fade away in its own. Any formation that is not paid attention to will fade. It'll lose its, its energy and, and fade away. So you don't have to make an effort to constrain the mind. You just relax. It should be have a relaxed feeling when you're doing this meditation and just disregard everything. Don't follow your thoughts or memories or daydreams. Just allow them to fade away in, in the background, like unwanted static or noise. Disregard them. And developing jhana, which is the state of perfection of samadhi, developing jhana is a natural progression of the mind if the uh, the five hindrances are made quiet. Now this is a, another very important aspect of developing meditation is to know this list of the five nivaranas. The word nivarana means a wandering in the wrong direction. And these hindrances are not to be thought of as so much as uh, roadblocks, but as side paths, as you go wandering off down the, the wrong path and the mind is drifting away. And these are five in number. There's uh, sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, uh, restlessness and worry, and uh, finally, um, skeptical doubt. So let's uh, 
at least briefly look at each one in turn. A sensual desire in the context particularly of the meditation and developing samadhi is much more than just the obvious falling into sensuality. It's any, really any movement of the mind towards objects of the sense, of the sense doors. Sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. We're trying to stabilize the mind, remember, on a single object at one sense door, in this case the sense of touch. So anything else that arises through the sense doors is a distraction. So we try and avoid that as much as we can. And it's in terms of developing the meditation, it's often the, the trivial kind of movements of the mind towards uh, pleasant sounds or smells or touches that, that uh, are more troubling. The jhana is actually a phase shift in the mind out of the sense experience or sense desire realm. It's a movement of the mind uh, like a quantum shift, a change in level from the kama bhumi, the sense level, to the uh, rupa bhumi, the level of form. So any playing around with the senses keeps you locked in that uh, kamabumi and you won't, you won't be able to enter jhana. You're entangled in the, in the, the weeds of, the, of this uh, sense-desire realm. Ill will works much the same way, but in the negative, you know, instead of desirable sense objects, it's, it's becoming upset or irritated by unpleasant ones. And this can often be very minor things, like there's a noise, one allows oneself to become irritated by it, or uh, the body's not completely comfortable and you, you feel irritation, or it's too cold, it's too hot. Um, and this also keeps you tangled in the objects of sense, and you can't lift the mind beyond. You can't transcend the sense realm as long as you're caught in these two, of desire and ill will related to the senses. Uh, sloth and torpor is sleepiness, tiredness, you know, dullness of mind. And it's a, it can be very insidious. You can just sink into a, a dull, dark space. And it's actually not the best practice. If you're, if you're dull, if you're sleepy, it's not a good practice to try and focus the mind more, to try harder with the samadhi, because you'll just hypnotize yourself in a sense and become duller and duller. You need to energize yourself first. These two, energy, uh, wiriya and samadhi, are complementary faculties. They, they balance each other. So there's a kind of a mind state that the Thai tradition calls bawanga, which is a term they borrow from Abhidhamma, although they use it a little differently. They talk about a meditator falling into bawanga, which means a kind of dull, sleepy state that can actually be kind of pleasant, but you get sort of stuck in there. There's no energy, there's no brightness. There's no clarity. There's just a, a kind of a, a dull sleepiness. Another name for this is uh, mitya samadhi or false samadhi. So you have to watch out for dullness. I think the the most important way of preventing and, and overcoming dullness is with the posture. Make sure that uh, you're sitting with the back erect and the head's not nodding down forward. Uh, this will this will help a lot. If it becomes chronic, if one's falling into dullness, then you shouldn't just keep trying to meditate harder. You should need to wake up first. So don't worry about losing some of the focus. 
get up and do some walking, open the eyes, you know, do what it takes to, to wake up. Restlessness and worry, uduccha kakucha, is agitation of the mind, which is obviously the opposite of stability or samadhi. It's the mind uh, jumping around into the past and the future and unable to remain still. And this is, in a way, the opposite of sloth and torpor. When the meditation is not going well, you usually are falling off the, the, the middle path in one way or the other, one side or the other. You're either too restless or you're too dull. If you're restless, the cure or the antidote is stillness. It's very important to remain as still as possible physically and mentally, even though it's difficult and may be painful. When restlessness attacks one, you'll never get through it by appeasing it. Meditators will come up with all kinds of excuses about things they need to do right now, anything other than sit still. But if you're restless, you, you won't get through it by giving into it and, and switching postures and doing this and that. You'll only appease it momentarily and it'll come back again. You need to burn through it by sitting still and restraining yourself. And the final one is skeptical doubt, which is the, uh, it's not doubt in general, it's a specific kind of doubt that um, it's a wavering of the mind, which again is incompatible with stillness when the mind is is uncertain this is another translation of which kitchen it's sometimes used it's maybe even better is uncertainty the mind is unable to stay with the meditation because of doubts in the mind of, you know, is this the right practice am i doing this correctly you know maybe i should be doing something else Whereas the progress is made when one just surrenders to the practice and just does it. So these five hindrances, whenever they're present in the mind, you need to, to suppress them, make them quiet, make them go away. And the mind will naturally, the samadhi will naturally deepen when these hindrances are not present. So the practice is intrinsically very simple, although, you know, fat books have been written about uh, Anapanasati, and there's a lot of um, different takes on it. It's really dead simple in essence. You just pay attention to the physical sensation of breathing and don't allow the mind to wander down the pathways of the Nuvaranas. Now I should uh, say something about because it, it comes up a lot in um, discussions and questions about the possibility of a, a nimitta arising. Nimitta means a mind-created image. And starting with the Vasudhi Magga, there's a lot of talk about the nimitta arising in uh, meditation, particularly in the context of Anapanasati, that one can have a simple visual object appear in the mind. It, it might be something as simple as a, as a disc, a colored disc, or even like a star point, a bright star point of light. It might be a little bit more elaborate, like a jewel or a Buddha image. And the um, instructions in the Vasudhimaga is to stabilize the nimitta and take that as the object. And a lot of um, modern or subsequent writers and teachers on Anapanasati will follow that, that tradition. I think this can, can work for some people, but for many people it's a dead end. And I think it's most people. It, it's, a, it's a distraction. The, um, 
the best advice, in my opinion, if an imita arises, is you can make an effort for a while to try and stabilize it. And if you can get a stable nimitta in the mind, you can take that as the object and focus on that instead of the breath. You're no longer doing anapanasati, but it's okay. You're going in the same direction. You're going towards samadhi and jhana. But if the nimitta moves around, changes color, fades in and out, changes shape, then it becomes just a distraction. There's no benefit to trying to maintain that nimitta. You'll lose it, and then you'll go back to the breath. It'll reappear. You'll go back to it. So you'll switch back and forth, and you don't make any further progress. So if uh, you're unable to stabilize the nimitta, subsequently just treat it as any other object to be disregarded as a distraction and remain with the breath. In this regard, there is um, discussion of a physical tactile nimitta, uh, and this is particularly mentioned in the uh, Vamuti Maga, another old meditation manual. And this, I think, is more appropriate for Anapanasati in general for most people most of the time, is that the um, it's not a visual image, but the physical sense of touch at the nose tip changes. At first, and for a long time, one is primarily aware of the movement of the breath back and forth across the nostrils. But at some point, that stabilizes, and awareness is held at the nose tip, and the sense of touch becomes uh, pronounced there, and the way it's described in Vimudi Maga, which I think is quite good, is it's a light sense of touch. As Imagine if uh, you had a, a piece of cotton wool and were holding it up against the nose. You know, it's, it's that sort of a steady, low-intensity sense of touch sensation. And the sense of movement fades very much into the background. So this is a physical or tactile nimitta, not a visual one. And this, I think, is more appropriate for Anapanasati. And it is what more, more often occurs. Before I uh, conclude, I'll also I mention the five Nawaranas, which are things to avoid or, or um, get rid of. And those five factors. There's also the five jhana factors that are to be encouraged and developed. And that is uh, Vataka, Vichara, Piti, Sukha, and Ikigata. And I'll just mention the definitions briefly. Vataka and Vichara are a pair, and uh, they're variously translated. A common one is applied and sustained thought, or initial and sustained application of mind. Vataka and Vichara are the mental energies that underlie speech and thought. They're essentially the mental energies that manipulate sankaras or objects in the mind. And when they're used in the context of meditation, vitaka is the mental energy that strikes the object, that pushes the mind onto the object, and vichara is the mental energy that holds the object. So vitaka is more vigor is more forceful and vichara is more steady, gentle, peaceful holding of the object. So a part of the um, skill, let's say, of developing the, you know, the holding of the object is balancing these two. That vitaka should be used sparingly because it agitates the mind if it's overused. But if the mind is wandering away, you need that little bit of effort to put it back on the breath. And then once it's back on the breath, you just hold the breath steady with vichara. And the, the holding of the object is com with vichara is compared to holding a raw egg in your hand. If you are too loose, it'll fall and drop on the floor and break. If you're too tight, it'll crack the egg. But a gentle holding is, is uh, this steady is vichara. 
but with Tycoon which are, are relatively coarse factors amongst the five and they disappear with the, the fading of first jhana into second jhana. Second jhana is primarily marked by the faculty of piti. Piti has been translated as happiness, joy, rapture. It's a more energetic, possibly even ecstatic kind of a happiness. It's a mental factor, but it does have a physical resultant or correlate. One can feel it in the body, like a thrilling sensation in the body. And then that becomes the coarsest factor and it fades away and the mind moves into sukha, which is an other kind of happiness, a more peaceful kind of oceanic happiness. It's often translated as bliss. But then uh, with fourth jhana, that fades away and the mind settles into upeka or equanimity. And throughout all four jhanas, constant factor is ekagata, which uh, is another one that the standard translation is a bit problematic, like samadhi. Ekagata is usually translated one-pointedness, but I think a better way of phrasing it is gone to unity. The mind is unified because it's not reduced to a point. It's still vast and expansive, but it's it's unified. It's not divided against itself, taking multiple objects. It's filled with the breath. So the best way to think about Anapanasati, you know, just to summarize a final kind of thought, the best way to think about it is not putting the mind onto the breath, but filling the mind with the breath. The mind should be mostly in a peaceful, open, receptive state, not pushing itself onto the object, but opening itself to the object, so that you're filling the mind with the breath. Think of the mind as a vast, expansive space, and the breath is coming like the waves of the ocean and filling it up. And everything else is, there's no room left for anything else. Everything else is pushed to the back and fades away. And the mind becomes solidly unified on a single object. So that's uh, some thoughts on the practice of Anapanasati. <laughs>